All right, here we go. All right. So, Mitch, welcome. This is uh, maybe our, I think it's like our 13th interview we're getting to right now. Um, first one outside of lacrosse. We, we just did a, we just did one with a guy who does a lot of like footwork and different stuff like that and just owns a gym. Um, but first, first guy we've had on here that's definitely outside of lacrosse completely. Um, so if you want to go ahead and just start, just kind of introduce yourself, just let us know where you're at right now and just a little bit of your, uh, your history and, and how you got to where you're at. Yeah, so uh, hey everybody, I'm Mitch Ford. I'm a uh, director of basketball operations at University of Buffalo for uh, women's basketball. I've, uh, you know, grew up Rochester, New York, uh, and Victor, played basketball, football growing up, went to Nazareth College, uh, played basketball there, you know, spent some time on, in the corporate world and uh, decided I had to get back into basketball. So I ended up uh, with an opportunity to be in sales with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, moved down to Charlotte, got the opportunity to meet some some people in the front office and, uh, you know, some people in personnel and really fell in love with, you know, the idea of getting back into coaching and being on the court, having more of a, a tangible, you know, experience with, with players. And, uh, yeah, that kind of led me to my pursuit of finding a job in the NBA. Um, and that's kind of how I... I really started, you know, taking off with my career. So I found an internship with the Dallas Mavericks that I, uh, you know, I found through the grapevine, just networking, connecting, applying, and uh, ended up spending my year, the 2018-19 season with the Dallas Mavericks, player development intern. So a lot of on the court, um, you know, playing defense, scout team, running through plays, doing some stuff with the G League team, uh, a lot of hands-on experience with, uh, you know, the best of the best. And, you know, it was a really good learning experience. And then after Summer League ended, it was an internship. It was just a year long. So I was just looking for full-time work. And I ended up uh, back in Western New York at uh, University of Buffalo doing what I'm doing now. So I was a video coordinator and then recently just promoted into operations. So it's been a crazy journey. It took me all over the ca- the country, but it's been it's been good. Yeah, that's awesome. Just uh, before we get into, I'm sure there's some interesting stuff that you've learned from all the different coaches and players you've kind of been exposed to. But going back a little bit yourself, um, you were a senior when I was a freshman in high school. You're a pretty dominant high school athlete. Um, always had big frame, just throwing guys around in football and just, I mean, dominating basketball. Um, and I'm pretty sure I remember you had some opportunities to play football, possibly Division One in college, and ended up kind of going the route of smaller time school and kind of following your heart, I would, I would guess, of, and your, your love with basketball. Um, so going back, what was the decision like for you to kind of follow your passion, go to a smaller time school, play basketball still versus the opportunities that you were getting in some other sports? Yeah, and you kind of hit it right in the head. Um, it's just it wasn't in my gut that I wanted to go play football. Um, you know, I knew and I was confident that, you know, I could have put on a little bit more weight and been a, a really good lineman or tight end or whatever it could have been. Um in football and it, it just wasn't in my heart. I didn't, I didn't enjoy practice. I didn't really enjoy, um, you know, the games are like no other, like there's nothing like Friday night lights and anybody who's played football can, can really attest to that. It's just a different feeling. Even if you, you know, it's not your main sport, it's a different feeling. Um, yeah. so it's just one of those things that wasn't in my gut. Um, I've never really had the, you know, that, that notion that, you know, playing division one was super important to me. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in my heart and in my, my mind and just in my gut that I know that I'm a better basketball player than a lot of division one basketball players. So that doesn't mean that, you know, Oh, I should have been there. I should have been there. Like, or they should be in a lesser level. Like, no, everybody's there for a reason, but you know, it's, that was just never an important thing to me. And, you know, being home, I had some personal reasons why I wanted to be around, around Rochester, uh, got the chance to play with my brother in college for two years, which, you know, not many people get that opportunity to do. So, and Naz was just a good fit. It was, it was just, 
I knew the coach. I knew I was familiar. I was comfortable, and you know, I met some some lifelong friends, and couldn't have had a better experience. What was uh, I guess some of the things that you learned from the recruiting process? Was it a late decision to to pursue basketball, or was it uh, maybe you didn't uh, go to camp specifically for basketball to pursue it? How did that sort of process go? Yeah. So um, during the summer of I guess it was going into my junior year I uh I did a couple like you know those bigger exposure basketball camps and uh you know there's <laughs> there's full core is 95 degrees out in the middle of July and and I'm out and uh we're playing outdoors on blacktop and I remember there's all these coaches sitting here at the side and and I take like four charges in a game and I'm absolutely just bloody head to toe like just gushing blood like they're like you can't even play you need to go change your shirt like we need to get you a new shirt and stuff like that and and uh all of a sudden it was just like 20 basketball coaches like like d2 d3 just came out to me and like hey like who are you what's who are you getting recruited by and that time it was like nobody really i was just whatever so uh you know that kind of kind of jump started the whole basketball recruiting situation and then uh you know with football you know basketball was always my passion growing up and I you know I regret not exactly putting as much effort into football as I probably should have um I was so focused on basketball that you know I didn't do the 6 a.m lifting workouts for football I didn't do the you know the camps that they told me to go to but I would still show up day one and finish in the top one or two people with our fitness test because I was in such good shape and I was, you know, still working on my strength and whatnot, just in different ways. Um, and football came pretty natural to me. Like I was just getting letters. Like I didn't reach out. I didn't, I took a few phone calls, but like that was just something that, you know, I had a, a pretty good natural talent with football and my, you know, my frame and my body type definitely helped me out with that. So uh, during my senior year, football stuff really started ramping up, getting a bunch of letters, whatnot, and uh, I just decided I didn't want to play. It just wasn't in my gut, and it kind of just narrowed down from 50 schools to 15 schools and kind of just went through the process from there. You have, at least when you're talking to kids now, do you have any, I wouldn't say regrets, but just advice when it comes to basketball and being exposed like the college level and the pro level a little bit now? Just any advice to two kids about being like more proactive about getting exposure, anything that you wish you possibly could have done differently to just kind of put yourself out there a little bit earlier, maybe could have changed just kind of your mindset on what your goals were or anything like that. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's more important now than it used to be. Um, you know, it was really, you go to like these two or three camps and, you know, people aren't posting stuff on overtime, but people aren't posting stuff on, on this to get yourself out. Like if you're not at this camp, you know, Jim Beheim's not seeing you. Like obviously he has a million connections and people have millions of connections, but like it, it's just a different time now. Like I personally think that I could have done a better job going to those camps at a younger age. Um, but I think now, like now is a generation of trainers. Now is a generation of, you know, AAU and videotaping everything and sending it to 500 people. And then you, you get that one person who gives you a full scholarship. And that seems to be, um, you know, what it's all about nowadays. And, you know, it's funny because some of these Twitter accounts are saying, you know, if you if you don't have your first offer by the time you're in ninth grade, then then you're a nobody. And it's like, that's just so not true. But, like, especially back when I was a kid and when I graduated high school 2012, like, 2008, that didn't matter. Like, no one had a – like, I don't care who you were. Nobody had scholarships at that age for a sport like basketball or, or football. Maybe it's a little different in lacrosse from what I've heard. But, um, but yeah, that was just never a thing. So um, I don't necessarily have any personal regrets. Um, I, I think I would have a regret now if I didn't have a trainer, if I took social media very seriously and, you know, if I didn't just try to give myself as, as much exposure as I could. Right. I think we, I think there's a lot of, 
similarities in a lot of sports, especially recruiting, like lacrosse wise, kids always ask me, they're like, what should I do to get recruited? And it's like such an open-ended question. Like yeah. there's so many different things, different for one person. You're in a hotbed area, you're, you're not. Uh, is there anything that you sort of tell kids and in terms of putting themselves in the best position possible, you talk about social media, going to the right camps. Uh, is there more to it? Uh, I guess if you want to elaborate. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much more there is. Um, have, have a coach really vouch for you and have them reach out to coaches. Um, mm. You know, there's, there's a million ways to go about getting recruited. Um, I mean, obviously the biggest thing is performing and you have to be put in a situation where you can perform. Like, you know, fortunately, like I said, I didn't really put too much um, effort into football, but like I was just put in a position that, you know, I, I could really succeed. And I was, you know, in a system that I picked up really quick and it gave me opportunities. Like that was just something that came pretty natural. I didn't do anything and I was getting recognized for it a little bit. Um, but like, I, I don't know how much more there is like nowadays you just got to be if you're one if you're tougher than everybody you're gonna you're just gonna separate yourself alone because kids nowadays are just soft and that's just kind of the truth and then again it's it's more and more and I'm I'm talking more about basketball like we get film all the time and it's just like who is this person stinks like who are they but guess what? If you send that to 2000 coaches, it takes one coach to think they don't stink. And it says, right. wow, this person might be a piece. So, you know, just due diligence, you know, recording everything and, and blasting it out there. Like, it's funny to see these kids that, you know, I used to work in a little travel basketball program and it says, Hey, I'm, I'm Mikey and I'm class of 2027. It's like, Oh my yeah. God, like you're in fifth grade. Like you're putting that on your Twitter. But like in, in reality, like he's going to have nine years of, <laughs> of video and it's like, we just, that's just something that was never a thing. Right. Do you believe in uh sort of specializing in sports? Basketball is one that you said you play year round. Uh, do you believe in that? Um, not at all. I think that, you know, and I think Sam's a great example of that because, you know, you were like, because I remember coaching you at basketball camps when you were a kid and I was like a senior in high school and you're in eighth grade or whatever, it's junior, like, and it was always like, Sam's the best athlete. I'm picking him up. I want him on my team. Like he was the best basketball, football, lacrosse player in his age. Like, I think that you, you can't specialize. I think it's just such a detriment. Um, you don't learn like teamwork skills like you would like you there's a whole different vibe like playing left tackle and a little bit of like tight end like you have a different relationship with your offensive line than yeah. you do it, like those five people rely on each other so much and it's different than relying on those five people on a basketball court it's uh, similar in a lot of ways but like you know you have to be in unison almost which basketball is a little more like jazzy you can kind of freelance a little bit and react like you can't really do that in football so like I think it's just it's really important to hone in on different sports and and learn some of those skills then then you bring it back to your main sport and be like well you know I see this one way but like this is what we did in football maybe this will work and like right. and then it's just like a, a brain dump and it's just like more and more information it's like oh okay well maybe this is the best way and it just might change your idea by 2%, but that 2% could be, you know, the one goal or the one basket at the end of a game. Right. Yeah. yeah. I feel like football is definitely unique in that sense where it's like the one sport where obviously you have like set assignments and plays mm -hmm. and nothing's really changing. One quick thing I kind of want to just go back to quickly was you were mentioning just getting tons of different film from different kids, whether it be class of 2027 and like that's obviously a huge thing that's completely different now. I was like, I was talking to our, my friends the other day, uh, Dave and Pat, Dave and Pat here. Actually, I don't even think Dave was here, but I was just like, it's crazy to think like kids, just like babies growing up now, like they're literally going to be, their entire lives are just going to be on like an iPhone. Like it's gonna, like the first generation of kids, they're just like, everything. Everything's documented. Their parents are going to be like, hey, like look at this picture of you as a baby every single day. Um, but when you are getting all these different inquiries, is there anything that, jumps out to you like I know you're on LinkedIn all the time I'm like my job is like LinkedIn right now is like 
just hammering messages on LinkedIn sales stuff. And it's like, no one even like reads it for the most part, but we're getting all these different messages. Is there anything that like sticks out to you or anything that anyone does that like kind of catches your eye ever or gives yeah. you a chance of just giving the kid a look? Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm not even going to talk specific to where I'm at now because honestly, I don't really have a, an on court coaching role. So I'm not really yeah. even going to get into that, but I'm just talking about in general, like if, you know, if you said, Hey, I have a 18 year old friend who's looking to be a, you know, college basketball player. Do you think you could help him get somewhere or whatever? Just like a sense from that. And I watch film. Um, the most important thing is, you know, is it a system and a culture fit? Like straight up, like, if you are a, like, I'll use my college basketball team, for example. So I was a six foot four power forward and I played some center. And it's like, there are kids that we played against that are six, eight and 260 pounds, but like they couldn't guard our teams for like at all. They couldn't guard me. They couldn't guard our system because we just did things a different way. So like you could send me the six, nine, 250 pound monster who can't shoot free throws and can't do this and he should be a beast, but it's like he probably wouldn't get – that's not the best opportunity for him to be put in a Nazareth basketball situation. And there's a million different things. So, like, I sit there and, you know, when I watch some of this film, it's like this person just doesn't fit. Like, their game, they're soft. Like, they are they don't play defense. There's something about it that you can usually pick up on. Like, and a big thing also is just – physical characteristics like do you do you fit the build and I don't know how it is like exactly for for the cross but like you know I know bigger guys typically play defense like a guy like me 6'4 215 like playing defense like you know that's a probably a pretty good build like yeah. for the most part and you know Maybe some coaches say, look, I, I like five foot eight defensive guys that are super quick. I don't know if that's a strategy that some coaches have, but like it's again, it's recruiting to your system. So, you know, there's a there's a million things to think about. Are they I mean, when it comes maybe even you're in an Ivy League, like you gotta think about academics and that's like a whole different thing. And then maybe you're at a school that you can get anybody in. Can you take the kid that, you know, that dropped out of high school and did this and had a had a tough time and no grades and can you take him and put him in your system and make it work so you know I don't really think that there's anything in specific it really just depends on like your system and uh you know your individual skill set because in the grand scheme of things it's the coach's job to find players that fit their system and if you really dive in on on hey, I am a three point shooting basketball player. I'm five foot ten, it doesn't matter. I am a three point shooter and you can go in and you can shoot forty percent in a game, there's a place for you in college basketball somewhere. And then it's just about again getting yourself exposed and in the right situation to get an offer or to get an opportunity to play. Yeah, a hundred percent. For for those you know, if you have a certain skill type thing, I mean, it's similar with lacrosse. I mean, obviously, if you're an insanely good shooter and a little less athletic, there's going to be a spot for you on a team. Um, what are some of the, like, at least with basketball, what was your experience with when you were just focusing on basketball? Did you have any type of trainers that you were working out with? Were you pretty much just on your own and just try to find stuff just online that you could do yourself? Or what was your experience like personally, just trying to work on your skills and then, I don't want to, I, I, this is, I'm kind of leaning to the second question, but I kind of want to ask too, it was just, you've mentioned just like, like the physical fits and stuff like that. When it comes to basketball, if you could touch on maybe just like what your size was like in like division three, like if you thought you could might maybe had a couple inches more, like what that could have meant for different division levels or if that, because I feel like that is definitely something that's more relevant in basketball than lacrosse, obviously just with the size of people. Um, but just, to start, I guess, sorry to throw two questions at you at once, but just to start, just kind of what your experience was like, just training as a kid and just if you had any trainers or anything like that. Like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, growing up, I I didn't really have many trainers. My thing was always just playing, and it was playing against older kids. And, you know, I had the opportunity at a young age to, you know, play on some good AU teams, some, you know, when I was a seventh grader, or I think eighth grader, I played on freshman and just always played up. And, you know, it was always about just playing the, the best competition. Um, you know, I think I had 
I'm very lucky to have some people in my life that taught me good footwork when I was young. And then it kind of just like progressed into probably my biggest skill. Um, and footwork isn't anything but a skill it is an absolutely a skill. Um, but yeah, so my, I mean, my thing was all about, it was all about the team, no matter what the situation was. Like in high school, I remember at one point going into my senior year, you know, Coach Clark is like, look, you got to start shooting some threes and you might have to bring the ball up some. And it's like, that's something I've never done in my whole life. But like, I just focused on, you know, looking up, you know, whatever, and looking up YouTube videos and, and doing this and working with people and just saying, going to pick up with college guys and saying like, no, nah, I'm a guard. They don't know who I am. I'm a guard. And like, that's how I would practice. Um, you know, I think that nowadays having a trainer, because that's something that I, you know, I've done in the past and something that, that I really am passionate about. I think it's really important because it just brings a whole nother mental aspect to your game. So I can sit in a gym and, and go full speed and take a thousand shots and, and hone a craft to a certain point. But then there's no, there's no really dialogue. Like I can get really good at a fadeaway shot to the baseline and I could, I can make it nine out of 10 times. And in a game I can pull it out and still, still hit people. But like when you have a trainer or somebody that you can, you can really like ask for real advice and have an authentic response, you can say, well, that's not the opportunity for that shot. Like how many times in your season are you going to take that shot? And like, you really like take a step back and you're like, Oh my God, if I take that shot more than three times a game, what am I doing? And you think about that, that's a hundred shots for the whole season. And it's like, that's, that's an absolute, like that's, that's crazy to think about. So like, you know, I think the biggest thing nowadays is, is having a trainer that you can trust and, and relate to. And I wish I did have that. Um, and I kind of saw the importance of that when I started working at the professional level. And, you know, I didn't think that it was necessarily extremely important for, for my individual game because of um, the level and, and the IQ that I kind of had. And I already um, had the chance to kind of separate myself from that aspect. And it was just really about getting my body ready. Um, but yeah, nowadays, especially to, to get to the highest level, having those people in your corner that can tell you, you know, Hey, like bring in a whole different side of IQ and then, you know, on field or on court experience, it's just that much more important. And then second part, um, you know, talking about, you know, if I <laughs> was a little bit taller, or if, if my physical characteristics were a little bit different, you know, I think that would have changed my style of play a little bit. Um, and maybe, I, I mean, it's hard to say, like if, if you're telling me that I'm six foot eight and not six foot four, things are probably going to be different. If you're telling me I'm six ten, <laughs> things are probably really different. Like I'm just, just by opportunity of just, you know, people wanting a, a skilled six foot 10 guy, like there aren't that many of them. So, you know, a lot of being six foot four is, you know, I'd say on the lower part of like the median for like a college four man, um, you know, a lot of six, six, a lot of six, seven, um, you know, there's some six, 10, six, nine guys that, you know, if they're at division three, there's, there's usually a, an issue with them. They're usually a hothead or, you know, don't have a ton of skill, pretty raw and, and whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It's just a perspective thing. Like, do I think that if I was six foot six, I could have done something different? Probably. I probably would have had to change my game a little bit to be a division one player. Um, I would have had to shoot more and post up last. Let's be real. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a million things, but physical character, characteristics are definitely definitely a factor yeah but it's but it's also something that you can work on like you know you can say oh i'm six foot five and i'm skinny and i'm a, a shooting guard and like well in college basketball in division three let's say like well if you put on 40 pounds and you're really skilled in the post and you can handle like that makes you a threat like if you're you know, I don't know how it is exactly for the cross, but like if you're six two and hundred fifty pounds, like and you can, you know, 
do one specific skill like at a, at a really good clip like and then you gain 30 pounds of muscle like that might just diversify your game that much more and it might you know allow you to you know play midi or do whatever you can do like you play some defense you play a different role for your team and have more success so like i said i don't know exactly how that works in the cross but when you when you went from from high school to college what changed in like your training from just being specific to one sport when you got exposed to the college level coaches, was there anything that was kind of like, oh, wow, like I didn't focus on this at all through high school? How did you kind of just hone in your craft when you got to the next level and could just focus mainly? I mean, obviously you were, you were mo- mostly focused on basketball before, but just from level to level, kind of what changed for you? Yeah, um, I think the, the first most important thing that, you know, a lot of kids don't get is, is just working on your mental, your IQ, your mental health, your everything that you can, you can put in a bubble of mental. I think that's everything. Um, you know, being. You here? Yeah, you're good. All right, sorry, I don't know why that cut out. Um, but yeah, so it's it's pretty much just you know working everything on your mental. Like you can you can go into college as a freshman, and I don't care if you're a freshman and anywhere there's not a ton of expectations unless you're zion williamson there's just not like for the most part like if you're not one of these top 10 guys there's not a lot of expectations so like you know the body thing is is gonna work out but like if you can separate yourself and find your role and say like look i can be the best you know in basketball terms like and i'm a point guard like if i don't turn the ball over i can find a role on this team and that's from building up a mental of, okay, I know all the plays, you know, I recognize how people are going to be playing these plays and like, and then it just goes into a whole branch of other things. Like if you're more vocal, you actually can comprehend things more and kind of go from there. So, um, you know, the biggest transition was, was certainly mental. I was a, you know, physically I was, I was ready. Like I was stronger than a lot of juniors and seniors in college basketball at, at division three as a freshman or going into that summer. It's just how it was. And I didn't know how to hone that though. Like I would go out and I think my sophomore year, freshman year, whatever, I had a hundred fouls. We played 25 games. You know what I mean? Like I have four fouls a game playing 20 minutes a game. And then like, by the time my senior year comes around, like I have it all figured out and I average, you know, a foul and a half a game or whatever, and I'm playing 36 minutes. So it's like, again, like that stuff is, is what really I think separates you. And I think I did a better job of working on that between my sophomore to senior year than I did from senior year to, you know, sophomore year. But that was definitely the most important thing. Yeah. hundred percent. You learned that from the players uh, that, that were like seniors, juniors on their team, or is that just from based on experience playing in college? What was it? Can you say that again? Sorry. Learn like most of your IQ from like coaches, players that were older than you, or like seniors that you looked up to, or was it just based on your play and your experience of just? Uh, getting yeah, I mean, I mean, a little bit of both for sure. I mean, you obviously you know have to listen to your coaches and, and buy into their system in order to have the opportunity to succeed. Um, and obviously, you know, they're getting paid to be coaches. Like they know what they're talking about and they like, you, you gotta listen to them. Um, but I mean, there's also like a, a huge part of self growth. Like there's just a, a huge part of, you know, if I, again, if I sit in a gym and, and do this and I notice, all right, well, I can watch this film and this guy does it this way. I'm going to try to implement this. But, you know, you learn things by, you know, doing it and be like, wow, that doesn't feel right. Like, I'm going to try to do it this way. And then, again, that's another reason why I think a trainer is so important is because, you know, they're non-biased and they're, and they're unbiased and they're on the side and saying, no, that looks a little weird. And it might not feel weird when you're on the court, but it's like, you know – that's something that's that's super important so um yeah i wanted to ask about sort of just like nba and just uh basketball players in general they talk about like being gym rats uh for most other sports it's like hey you're in the gym pushing weight but for basketball players you're in the gym shooting 
And like, even like the Jordan doc, he's like, I didn't start weightlifting until he was in the pros and had to deal with physicality. Uh, is there anything, is it something that screws up just weightlifting wise, screws up your stroke as a shooter, makes you tight? Uh, what's your balance between just being in the gym versus uh, in gym weightlifting versus being in the gym shooting and getting those movements? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, the only thing that really gets affected when you get stronger is, I mean, obviously you're, you know, if you put on 30 pounds of muscle, you're probably a little less flexible and that's yeah. a big deal in basketball. So that's why you don't see a lot of these guys like Michael Jordan's the most athletic guy in a generation. That's why he didn't need to put on 30 pounds yeah. because he was just out athleting people. <laughs> um, but like, I think it, it can mess up your shot a little bit and it, I think that that's something that you just have to play a fine line with. Like, you know, if you're just, it's not beneficial for a basketball player to sit and just go in and bench press every single day and try to get their max up to 450 pounds. That doesn't, that doesn't do anything like, Oh great. You can push two handed, push this guy It's like, that is a foul in basketball. Like that doesn't benefit you. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously you know the strength thing is important and being able to rebound and, you know, ball security and, and a million different skills that, you know, hone into that. But, you know, I think it's very, um, it, it's just, a, you have to play the fine line. Like you just can't get too big and it might mess up your shot for a little bit, but after a while, it's just like you get your stroke back and, and then you're better than ever. So, uh, I think it's, I mean, obviously important to, to stay lean and stay strong, but like necessarily just building on, like adding, 20 pounds of muscle like that might hurt some people more than it'll hurt others but you know it could be important it's pretty pretty case by case did you have a workout regimen in college that sort of that sort of followed the line of like hey we want you to uh, build muscle mass here or was it sort of what, what type of workout regimen was like yeah yeah i mean we would lift you know three times a week or whatever the case would be um from an individual standpoint, I would, um, I would swim a lot. I would box a lot. Um, I would do some things that were kind of mixing up cardiovascular, but again, like, you know, if you've ever swam a couple miles, like you feel it, like your whole body is like, you're feeling it in your shoulders and in your core and everything. And like, and what's more important for, you know, a basketball player than to have, you know, basically just feel tighter and, and more, you know, athletic and whatever. So, you know, those are some of the things that I did. Um, you know, we were always given our weightlifting regimen. It's, it had bench, it had, you know, dumbbell press and all that stuff. Um, and there's a very specific like science behind it that's related to basketball. It's not related to a, a few different sports. Um, but honestly, like for me, my biggest thing was, can I s stay healthy? can I be stronger than everybody in the conference? And can I be quicker than everybody in the conference? And with those three things, I was able to have success because I think that I kind of, um, on an individual level, like really, really reached all those points for my capabilities. Yeah. Did you, how did you in college, would you just watch like film of yourself? Like to like, you were always really good with like footwork and stuff like that. But when you reach the point of being the best in the conference, in your opinion, was there anything that sticks out that you were able, was it just like watching yourself move or just like having other people around you be able to tell you more or like what kind of changed? To, or, yeah, or yeah. a big thing was watching, you? watching the bad. Um, you know, you have to be self-critical. You have to, you know, at one point my junior year, I, you know, I was struggling to start off. I was kind of like, freshly the the focal point um we graduated a really good senior class and I was kind of like one of the next guys in line to be scoring a lot and my first like five games that was you know playing more minutes and playing a different role and getting beat up a little more like it was always their best defender not their third best or whatever the case was I, it was just different so I struggled um I struggled with that a little bit but uh Dude, I completely forgot where I was going with that. I literally completely forgot. Uh, I struggled a little bit with footwork, focal point of the offense. Oh Getting my more God. bodies to you. 
I literally just completely blacked out what I was going to say. <laughs> Blue there. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Dude, I wanted to hit on one of, I wanted to, before we kind of ask you about some things you've kind of picked up along your, your journey through different exposure to different players and stuff. But one thing that I was, I was laughing to myself when you were talking earlier, talking about getting a bunch of fouls is, uh, I just remember high school football, you're probably the only player that I can remember just ripping guys' helmets off, throwing them out of piles, just literally helmets flying into the sidelines of opposing teams. It was, it was a phase. It was so a phase. Now that you bring it up, I definitely remember a small anger streak. And yeah. it was pretty scary back in the day for a young freshman. It was, it was a phase. Um, it was a phase. And, uh, you know, I'm not something I'm necessarily proud of now, but, uh, you know, again, I, I didn't know how to really hone it. Um, I didn't really know how to hone, I guess, this pent up anger. And that was also like another reason why, for real, I got into boxing because I was like, I'm literally going to beat the hell out of this bag. Like that's, that was like a release of some sort. And then, you know, throw yoga on top of that, throw swimming, which was pretty, you know, relaxing. It's always quiet in there and, you know, stuff like that. And then it kind of brought me back to, to being a real mindful athlete, not just a, a brute. Start doing that stuff. Like you said, you made a big jump from your sophomore to junior year in college. Did you start doing that boxing yoga stuff in college or when did you yeah. pick that up? Um, um, and that was, that was right around um, sophomore year. So, you know, we had a, like I said, we had a really good team and, you know, at, at the first couple games, I didn't really get, I still was kind of in freshman year mode. I didn't really get it. Um, and then I kind of just like submitted a little bit, I guess, to the team and kind of really realized how good we were and how good, like how important it is to play a role. And, you know, it was, it was really after that season though, like the week after I said, how can I mix this up to, to fix this? I have, I have to fix this. Um, so, you know, what might that be? Well, for me, it was, it started with yoga and yoga, just like more flexible, more whatever. And then I still like, you know, you hone in mental skills and then it was sitting there like, I need a release though. I still feel like after yoga, I'm tense. And then I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go hit the bag. I'm going to go do this for, even if it was 20, 30 minutes, like that's draining. Like that is absolutely draining. And then, you know, I would mix in swimming instead of doing you know, sprints or whatever, because I had bad knees and it was good for my whole body. So, and that's kind of how I decided to go into those different things. And then, so going through your time with say the Mavericks, was there anything that you noticed that a lot of players were doing possibly similar to that? Were they doing a lot of like yoga or anything to work on mindfulness or is anything outside of basketball to kind of dial in for basketball? Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I took the most, and, um, I think it's probably the most important thing in an athlete is, um, is mental health. And, you know, we in Dallas, we had a mental skills coach and we had a mental skills coach that was with the G league team, but he was always, you know, in the NBA facility too. And they're doing, I mean, he's a sports psychologist and they're doing so many different things, whether it's projects, whether, whether it's this or that. And that's something that was a big focus. Um, you know, they had a yoga teacher and, or a yoga person in all the time. Um, you know, there's so much in the NBA that is, there's so much good because they have so many resources. So it's really like whatever a guy is comfortable doing, like sometimes they bring in their own trainers and their own weight room guys and you know if if you're a and I'm not going to name specific names but you know if you're a 7 foot 4 player from Latvia and you're in <laughs> with the Mavericks like you have a probably a different weightlifting regimen than you may have from a a person from the United States who's a guard like you just have a different thing like you know different people rely on different people for different things and you know it's however you can make it work individually was there anything that you could sort of take home or, I mean, there's obviously coaches, but was there anything that say, they said consistently like, Hey, define that mindfulness as an athlete. Is there anything that you work on outside of just swimming, hitting the, hitting the gym, stuff like that? 
Yeah, um, reading. I I think reading is such a, you know, obviously a lot of people read, but like, you know, what do you read? Like, I think reading any type of self-help or anything to to build a skill, like one of my favorite books is called Atomic Habits um, by James Clear. And he literally breaks down like the whole science behind what a habit is, like how to implement it, how to be more successful implementing it, how to, you know, and it could start with the smallest things like, okay, you have a bad habit of waking up and not brushing your teeth in the morning, let's say, like, it's just a very simple thing. And it's like, all right, well, what habits can you build prior to that and like stack your day that make that more likely that you're going to do it? Like, all right, you already have it laid out for you in the bathroom and you put your clothes for the next day in the bathroom, whatever it is. Like, it just like teaches you how to build habits. So I, I think just reading is a, a skill that, you know, those are real life examples that you can build good habits in other things. And you can build good habits on the court and, you know, mentally and meditate and blah, blah, blah. But like, that's something that I learned from, from reading, not from, you know, going out and just playing. Like that's just taking a step back and just taking a different look. And, you know, reading has been something for me, but everybody needs their outlet. Like some people, it might be, you know, just drawing and it, it clears their mind for an hour. And that's, you know, really important for some guys. Like that's something that probably would have worked for me back in college because I probably would have thought not about being angry (laughs) and I would have just been like doing whatever. So from just learning the ideas of building on habits, do you have any, any new beneficial habits that you've picked up in the last couple of years that have, like I said, beneficial have helped you out a lot? Yeah. Um, stretching is a huge one. I stretch every day. Um, you don't believe how much better you feel. And if you go like, I mean, if you're an athlete and you're like, oh my God, I'm so tight. And then being a a retired athlete, you're like, oh my God, my knees hurt so much. But it's like, no, I can put both my palms to the bottom of my foot and I don't get that stiff anymore. Like, yeah, I hurt bumps and bruises and and whatever, but like stretching is a a ridiculously good habit. Um, Another thing is making lists. I always make lists of of everything I'm doing. So, you know, I'll just get a composition notebook and just do Monday through Friday. What are things I got to do? And if I don't get it done, maybe I can move it here and I'll move some things certain places. But it's just like everything that's on my mind, just on a piece of paper. And then it's okay. Can I just knock these off here and here and here? Um, So making a list, definitely um, stretching is another one. And, you know, Another big thing is um, there's a book that I read and this has kind of helped me a lot and it's called uh, Unfuck Yourself. (laughs) And uh, it basically has seven affirmations in it that like you just say, you know, every day you can just read a chapter and go through like, hey, I'm going to win the day or whatever the, the affirmation is. Like I'm like I'm wired to win is one of them. And it's like if you tell yourself that you're wired to win, you're you're just inherently more likely to have a positive attitude about something. Um, so, you know, I don't, I've done a, a worse job at that lately, um, with the pandemic stuff, because sometimes I'm, I get caught in my own head a little bit. Um, but you know, the, the stretching thing is an absolute, like, I can't do my day without it. Um, and then my list thing, my list is the reason that I'm, I'm able to do everything. It's the reason that I'm on time for this this call. It's the reason that I'm I'm doing all that like all this stuff. So yeah, I can attest to that. I think making a list that's I've always set myself up for a great day and by making a list. I think it helps mm-hmm. out a ton. Uh, I guess in terms of just an athlete and the mental game is huge. And I guess everybody tries to replicate that like one time that you played your best, you were considered in that flow state as an athlete. Were there times that you can look back at where uh, we talk about just having success or your best game possible and sort of what sort of led to that? Was there anything that you had in mind prior to that game that you thought about and you try to replicate on a daily basis, that sort of mindset style? Yeah. Yeah. um, You know, I think you kind of, 
you know, you said a little word, um, like the flow, like you just got to find your flow and, and that changes, um, depending on the person, like, you know, you just, you know, when you're really clicking and you're, you're really, you know, scoring in basketball, when you're really shooting well, like usually you're just the least focused on everything else. You're just, you're truly in it. Um, and you know, I think that's all my best games have been, you know what? Screw it. Like I'm so confident and I know that I'm going to do what's in the best interest for my team and put myself in the position to do well. Like, like once you hit that flow state, it just kind of propels itself. And I think another thing, like you, you touched upon the mental part too, like, you know, uh, one of the most important skills I think is being able to not react and not get out of that flow. Like it's so easy for, you know, and I'm not going to say like, you know, Draymond Green does a pretty good job at it, but like he's a guy where he can go out and act out a little bit and be crazy. But then he goes, he flips the switch right back to being like the best teammate and, and the glue guy. And the reason that that Warriors team is so good, um, like he doesn't let that interrupt his flow. And that's why he's so dynamic in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really just getting in that zone and, and just, staying there and, and being able to build your your mind to let you propel through the the highs and the lows right because like some people some people get like super excited when you know they make a huge shot and then the next time they catch it they're just like too tense yeah and it's and it's just like that's not you'll never have your best performance if that's if that's something that happens to you right you were when you were at the Mavs you would like just be you'd like have to show up to the gym a lot of times if like guys wanted to work out and stuff like that right mm -hmm. um did you just from the guys that you would be around did any of them have like a lot of like really solid routines where they were like all right like we gotta be in the gym like 6 a.m like every one of these days or just from looking at what those guys were doing being at the pinnacle of the sport was there any whether it be guys or just habits routines that like really sticked out to you and you were like damn like this guy's dialed in like he's always getting in that flow state and yeah anything that stands out around there there no and uh you know i'll i'll use a a fun one that is like the most personal and the most uh you know probably the the coolest thing that i saw that was was dirk um being around dirk and even at 41 years old like his, he's out there with the shooting coach, Holger, and uh, he would fly him in from Germany every once in a while, and they would go through the same routine that he went through when he was 16 years old. The same, you know, whatever fadeaways and the same footwork, and he makes seven at this spot, and whatever the case was, like, those guys are just, it's just a ritual. It's, it's crazy. Um, you know, some guys are different. Like, they'll just be like, hey, we'll get on the court and we'll do an hour of this, some guys just go in and shoot. Some guys, you know, focus more about the off-court stuff. Um, and, like, here's another good example is uh, I don't know how this might not be 100% credible, but, like, I know J.J. Redick has had the same shooting routine since he was, like, nine years old. And it's like, you know, that's worked for him. That's his comfortability. He's, he's just so meticulous with that routine and whether it's making, I don't know what it is, making 300 shots or making, taking 3,000, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, like, if, you know, the guys are, it's, it's next level. It, it really is a, a different mentality to be able to go do that every single day and just not get bored and know it's for a greater purpose. That's crazy. Yeah. What, uh, with long with with that stuff too um like you you uh did you i think dave was telling me a story about you getting dunked on by luca once would you like what was like just like the level of, of a, a athleticism like compared to just anywhere else that you played yeah. just being around those guys yeah. just, just, dave's gotta chill <laughs> 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 no um yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't, first off, it wasn't like chest to chest, like I got like dunked over. Let's, let's be real. It's, I wouldn't let that happen. Um, no, but the, it's, it's just a whole, 
it's a whole just another level um you know people think you're the best basketball player at uh what's a good example uh St. Bonaventure you're the, you're the all-time leading scorer at St. Bonaventure and you might be an absolute nobody in the NBA like you are you are not even in the top 500 you're not even in whatever um and you like people don't realize how hard it is to get spot 300 to to 450 it's those guys are so hungry and they're so good and they have such a niche um like a guy like let's say uh Harrison Barnes because he was hurt for a little while and you know I was just messing around with him one day and I was saying one of the coaches was like Harrison you want to play anything like live you want to do like you know one on one for a bit and I was over there working with him and Harrison's like no like I don't I, I'm good today I, I did a lot and I just like turned to the coach as a joke I was like he's just scared he's like he doesn't want like he doesn't want this like whatever just messing around and like literally like that like it's it's 11 nothing like he hits 11 mid-range post-up fadeaways and I, I'm just getting crushed like he just got back on the court and just absolutely annihilated me it was like athleticism mental skill everything just combined and it was an absolute domination like I felt so inferior for like the first time in my life um it's just it's such a different it's just different and then you walk in and you see a guy like you know Porzingis that's seven foot four dribbling the ball up the floor and shooting from almost half court and it's like oh my god like this is absolutely bizarre like yeah and I remember another thing I was like you know not from like necessarily an athleticism standpoint because I might have been more athletic than Dirk his last year let's be real he's he was hobbling up and down but you know we would he was hurt and he was coming back from an ankle injury and he would play full court with us and everyone's like, yeah, I got Joe Schmo, and we're just like other coaches and whatnot. And I'm sitting there, the last person on the court, like, I got Dirk. Like, all right, cool. I'm I'm out there, and he might have had, I mean, we played like four 10-minute running quarters, and he was like 15 for 16 shooting, like all mid-range, like fadeaways, whatever. And I'm sitting there after the game pissed because we lost. And then I'm sitting there like, Dude, that's the sixth all-time leading scorer ever. Like yeah. like ever and I was like pissed, but it's just like it makes you like come back to reality like these guys are just special. Yeah. What did you notice about Dirk being obviously legend, old guy on the team, but just says like a teammate perspective just from what you witnessed like what was he like whether it be off the court or just on the court was he basically just another coach out there or mm-hmm. What he's kind of, just kind the, of set him apart all, he's all. just such a good you know he's the nicest guy in the world he he's he really is but like he flips that switch and he's an ultra competitor at the same time but you know we're talking about like locker room guy and and this and the relationship with anybody he can talk to anybody he's he's out there you know teaching he's out there doing this and he was just all around like what you want in a a person in your organization like not even just a player like you just want those people around in your life like he is really just I mean the humility of him to being retired and and being in like an intern with the Mavs and he's in the intern group and then he's out you know when all the riots and stuff are happening he's just out painting walls and he's like repainting stuff and it's like it just shows like that that's who he is and you know it kind of just carries across like why he is such a good everything he's just right. he's just got that mindset awesome that's awesome um any any bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise expertise in the basketball world so for, for yeah so any for kids coming up anything that you hear that you think is bad bad advice uh, bad advice. Um, a lot of people say like high school basketball doesn't really matter. It's all about AAU and, and trainers and your videos and whatnot. Um, I think high school basketball is incredibly important cause it really still is like 
the real foundation of basketball. Like AAU is a lot of fast breaks and donks and it's the highlight reels uh, most of the time. And like, you know, you still got to learn how to play like team basketball. So I would say like, you know, when people transfer here and there and they do this and that, it's like, look, man, like if you're really that good, like make your team the best, learn how to be this, take, bring your teammates with you. Like, obviously there's a, a time and a place if, if you really think that it's going to hurt your ability to, you know, really get to the next level. Like if, if you're talking about getting, you know, D2 looks and you go to a bigger school and you're starting to get like big 10 looks for basketball, like that's, that's a difference. Maybe you do that, but I think that's one thing. Um, Yeah, I mean, everyone tries to be like Steph Curry. I mean, you got to be able to shoot the three, but, like, you know, you don't have to. You just got to, like, hone your own role. What was, what was the – what was the – with the Mav, what was the time split of, like, organized practice for guys and then just how much time they're putting in on their own just in the yeah. gym? Whether, that, that's whether that's so out. tough um, because that really varies player for player. Um, like a guy like Dirk who, you know, he doesn't need as much like practice reps necessarily. Um, it's really about keeping his shot consistent, keeping this, whatever. Um, and then when you get like a younger, like let's just say uh, – like a Jalen Brunson who was, I mean, he's different because he's a winner and he really knows his stuff, but like he's a 22 year old rookie at the time when I was there and he's, you know, thrown into that backup point guard role. Like it's important for him to practice and get the reads against NBA guys and do this and do that. Um, but a lot of the guys, it, it just depends on who they are. Like Harrison, Harrison Barnes, when he was there before he got traded was, I mean, he would do, 500 makes before practice and then after practice he was always doing some stuff too like he was just an absolute workhorse meticulous like robot almost and then there's guys who you know they just go up and do some shooting competitions because they need that competitive thing to bring out like whatever it is they might only take 50 shots but you know it's competitive and that's what they need Um, so personal goals for you, you said you're obviously retired athlete now (laughs) goals of getting into the NBA. What for you personally, what do those goals kind of look like? Like what are like the small steps to get there? What are you kind of striving for? And like, I know you're super active on LinkedIn, but just for like lacrosse, the basketball, like it's obviously completely different. Just with yeah. the amount of people that play the sport in lacrosse versus basketball, it's way harder to get to the top. Um, but you've kind of gotten a taste of it. So, what does that grind look like for you? What's what's your kind of goals look like? Whether it be small to get to the bigger ones, but what's that look like for you now? now? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me right now, it's about learning as much as I can and laying a foundation in a lot of different areas like you know I went and didn't have any video experience when I was with the Mavs Um, and then I got this this year of video experience at UB and now I'm going to be in an operations role and it's it's you know a really important thing because operations is is critical at in any job in anything is is being able to you know do the behind the scenes stuff so you know whatever my opportunity may be I just really want to get as much perspective from as many areas as possible. Do I think I want to be an NBA head coach? No, I, I really don't. Um, but like, does that mean I don't think I would be a great player development or assistant coach someday? That doesn't mean that at all. I think I could be great. Um, I could see myself doing some scouting stuff. I absolutely love like talent evaluation. But again, like I don't, I'm not trapping myself into you know, one specific thing, um, kind of keeping my options open and, you know, just kind of seeing where this will take me. But, you know, like I said before, reading and working on my mental and doing all those things to prepare myself for whatever opportunities might come and, uh, you know, kind of going from there. I, I think that, you know, the NBA will definitely be a part of my life for a long time. 
And whether that's from a consulting role, a coaching role, a management role of some sort, shoot, maybe it's even business and not coaching at all. Like, I think that that's just going to be part of my life going forward. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have, I have goals to be at a certain place and be valued and appreciated and, and whatnot, but I don't know if I have the answer of, I want to be an assistant coach by the time I'm 30. Uh, I just think learning and, and working on myself is so much more important right now. Just kind of taking the opportunities to come. Do you have, do you have, when you're looking at your goals and trying to find just the best opportunities possible, do you have any mentors or anyone that you look at and just really admire what they're doing and you try to emulate or just anything like that? Yeah, no, I totally do. And, uh, and I'm not going to name names just because it's, it's not really the, the place for that. But I have a, uh, a small group of people that, you know, I, I really rely on hard in the coaching world. Um, you know, some of them aren't even necessarily basketball coaches. Um, you know, one person I really admire is an author. And there's somebody who does, they, they travel and they speak about mindfulness and they speak about the mental and how to, you know, the mind of a, an athlete or the mind of a coach. Like, I think that's something that is super important, especially in a generation like this. Um, yeah, I have, I have basketball mentors that I keep up with all the time. And, you know, I have the phone calls every two weeks and, and we keep in touch and just talk shop, like, you know, what's happening? What do we think is going to happen? Oh my God, is there going to be a college basketball season in the fall? Nobody knows, but it's like, you know, you have to have those people that you, you, uh, you lean on. So, and one thing that I'll, uh, I'll share that I thought was really cool. And like you mentioned about LinkedIn, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn and I love, you know, taking phone calls from strangers, helping them out, doing what I can kind of just like piecing things together. But you know, one person said, I'm going to draw it out. Like if you have a bullseye like this and it's like this right here is your five like this is your core group of people whether that's family whether that's your your co-workers and obviously you can do a million of these in your life like this could be literally family whatever boom 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 and go out but it's like just from a basketball standpoint like this is my five guys that i i really rely on and they're like the the people that i talk to every day i said hey i'm struggling with this what do you got what do you guys do and like this next one might be like 20 people. So you sit there with those 20 people and those are people that if they hear about a job or they hear about an opportunity, you might not talk to them every day. It might be a once a month thing, but it's a, people you keep in touch with that, you know, you have a mutual respect for each other's intelligence, work ethic, everything. And, and you kind of just, it's like a brotherhood. It's almost like a fraternity at that point. And then there's just everybody else that's, you know, that you're connected to. And obviously there can be way more layers than that, but you know, maybe that number is five, 10, a thousand. Maybe you have a thousand people that you're just kind of, whatever, I know them. Like that's a coach that I met along the way. Like I worked a camp with him one time, two years ago. And you say, hey, look, I'm, a, I'm an assistant coach at Maryland Lacrosse and I worked a camp and this guy's a high school lacrosse coach. I worked a camp with him five years ago. And now it's like, oh, shoot, that kid might have a player for me someday. Like, maybe I should give him a call. And it's kind of just like a, a guy in your network. Um, and I think there's more levels to that. And there's there's tiers in each of those different things. But that's just something that I was kind of told. Like, you know, you really got to have that, that narrow group of people and then kind of expand from there. 100%. I think that that's everything in life. I think it's just having those relationships, networking with the right people and sustaining those relationships. Uh, yeah. I think you learn that as a kid. It's like you can't do everything on your own. And if you do, uh, you're going to learn the hard way. And But it's it's tough. Like growing up, I, I just remember like I didn't want to ask questions. I didn't want to keep uh, like people in my sort of inner circle on what I felt on how I was feeling because I didn't want to share it. Uh, is there anything that you do? Do you seek mentorship? Was it, is it like more of a natural thing that you focus on? Yeah. Elaborate on. So oh, I, I definitely do. Um, and I think that is a, an absolute focal point of what I do um, is 
I think I've become a much more humble, well-spoken, mindful person because I seek mentors that are those types of people. They're, they're the good guys and they're not the people who kind of just say, Hey, I'm, I'm this person's son. I'm, I, my last name is this and I'm going to get this job. Like, no, I'm, I'm dealing, I'm in the trenches with the real people that are struggling in coaching to, Oh man, I'm making $5,000 a year. I don't know if I can do this, but like, I'm, I'm smarter than that guy at that division one school. It's just like, I, I put my more effort into this. Like I, I do this. And, and those are the people that if you surround yourself with, you know, it kind of, it's contagious. And that's like talking about like more on like an even level, but like same thing, like you can get mentors and you hear their stories about, man, I was a, a walk on and I was this and, you know, I got a scholarship by the end and I've, you know, I started off in, in Juco and then all of a sudden they're a division one head coach and they're the head coach at Gonzaga or I don't know. I mean, whatever his background is, but like you just never know. And, and you, you take things from their story. Like, you know, I have a mentor friend of mine, division two coach and, you know, hearing about like, you know, the desire to, to go division one and whatever, five years ago and then all of a sudden five years later it's like man that's just not what I want to do like there's there's a a reason I'm here there's a you know whatever but I gained perspective from that and an appreciation from that and I played division three and like do I want to be a division three coach this week no I don't because I don't think that that's in the cards right now and I have my my sights set to the NBA and that's that's really where it's at but it's like it's one of those things that I'm a lot more mindful and from mentors and from people that I talk to that you know I'm open to that someday or I'm open to you know if I was a head division one coach hiring a division three guy because I I get it and I've I've seeked mentorship and I've seeked relationships with people that that are in that realm and that just helps me grow as a person awesome when you when you talk about your your inner five, are those people that are more like mentors to you and you're reaching out to try to get advice from them or are they more people, similar spot to you, similar goals, all kind of struggling through the same things and then you've got those more established mentors, try to get those in like that next circle of 10. Yeah. Or and, how you kind of, and, like, how and like I said, like there's, there's tears to it and there's no really right or wrong answer. Um, you know, and that was more of a broad example. I don't think that that's necessarily specific to my life. Um, but like, I think the people in my circle, they're not all basketball coaches. Um, and I'm, I'm taking, I, strictly look at that from a career standpoint. I don't really look at that from like a, my family is obviously in like the middle, middle circle. Like that's what's, you know, to the core, what is important, but yeah. you know, the, there's that group that it's just, you, you know, and they're the people that you, you can really dive in with. It's uh you know, I'm not going to name names again. Like I'm trying to keep that whatever, but you know, I talk to somebody almost every day and they're not even in the same realm as me necessarily like the same profession like they're the same realm not profession um it's like we would we would work together someday but it's like you know there's really no talk like i can't talk basketball with that person i can't talk x's and o's it's more about like this is their grind this is my grind how are you getting through it how do you do this and i find that so much more valuable than you know, obviously there's value in talking basketball, but like you need those people that are just, they're with you and they know the grind and they know what, it, what it's like to make a thousand dollars a year or whatever the case is. Um, so, yeah. Do you have any, do you have any specific, whether it be in basketball or outside of basketball, just any specific vivid failures that you kind of had and you kind of learned from and kind of led to success down the line? from something that you could, took from that situation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think failures are super important to reflect on. Um, so I, I take, you know, as, as weird as this sounds, um, you know, my junior year, we, it was my coach's only losing season, I think, in like 18 years of being a head coach. Um, we were young, you know, a couple injuries here and there. 
like me personally, like I had my career high, I had 49 in a game, I averaged, I led the league in scoring, I did this. Um, I was just not, I wasn't a great leader. Like I was a, a leader by give Mitch the ball and he's going to score a majority of the time. And I don't think that that like, that wasn't like, we weren't like a really efficient team. And I took a lot of blame for that. And I, I see that year as, yeah, I'd led the league in scoring and second in rebounds. And you know, that's a failure. Like that is an absolute year of failing <laughs> because what's, what's the point of playing any team sport is, is to win and, you know, whatever. Um, I think the following year I, I honed that in a little bit, but that's an, that's an ongoing thing. Like that was like rock bottom to me in regards of me being a leader like I am now. And, you know, I, I build on that all the time, but that was probably my moment that, uh, you know, after I reflected on that season, I was like, this is, uh, you know, I failed pretty bad. I messed up, but I work on it every day. And, and that's even where, going back, kind of touching back on like habits, like I build good habits of doing certain things. So those failures don't happen. So like I can, I can be more organized and I won't fit, like slip back into being a bad leader. Well, good leaders are usually organized and they know, you know, what they have to do and when they have to get it done by That's why writing stuff down is so important to me. Like, because I think it's such a bad form of leadership is when you don't know what you have to do when you're just kind of winging it um so yeah kind of kind of my spiel on that was that just was that just you like knowing like i was a bad leader or did you have to have like someone tell say something to you like hey you could have picked these guys up more like how did you realize yeah yeah. um you know my my coach like we talked about it and stuff and you know I was a little like stubborn because I came back from an injury and like I don't know exactly what it was but in conference I was just like I was just killing like I had like I was probably averaging like 28 in conference and I was I was just like you know so like all right focused on my game and I was so locked into this and you know, I didn't really realize, I didn't even like see what was happening. I didn't see that like we were losing. Like I didn't care that I wasn't like, wow, I'm going to go, I'm not J.R. Smith. I like, man, I need to go get my 20 or I'm like metal. Like I wasn't like that, but it was like, you know, I would go do it and then I would be crushed by every loss. And then I was like, well, I didn't have to, to go out there and score so many points. Like I could have done this and got other people involved and, and stuff. And after the season, just kind of looking back with my coach and some people close to me, it was just kind of look, man, like you, you messed up. Like you, you didn't, you know, from an individual skill and scoring standpoint. Yeah. You might've been like pretty close to the top of what you could have done, but like, that doesn't mean I was a good leader at all or a good teammate for that matter. And for for the where we're at now with with Corona, to try to find some type of positive takeaway with everything. Is there anything that you weren't doing before COVID that you've started doing now that you have a little more time to kind of look at yourself and just obviously everyone's got a lot more time for reflection. But just any positive takeaways from from COVID that you started doing and possibly want to keep doing afterwards? Yep, yep. Uh, I do ten miles a day, um, whether it's running, jogging, walk, jogging, whatever it is, like I make sure I go out and do 10 miles. Um, like earlier today, I think I did four and, uh, you know, I'll probably get out and do another, another seven or eight. And then, you know, whatever else I do in between, like that's super important to me right now. Just, you know, not letting my physical shape, you know, drain. And another thing is I've been reading more and, and talking to people about, you know, what they're reading and kind of asking for more advice and, and doing different things like that. And, you know, there's always room for improvement. So if you can, you know, improve a little bit each day, I think that's, that's really important. If you could, if you give one book as a gift to people right now, what would you give? Oh, that is a tough one. Um, I think I think Atomic Habits, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, is a really good one. Um, 
you know, and the whole foundation, like I just mentioned, actually kind of ironic. Um, I just said like, you know, get 1% better or whatnot. The main basis of that book is called the aggregation of marginal gains. And it basically says if you get 1% better for this long, like your slope goes way up. If you get 1% worse or you don't get better and it just plateaus and you just get a little bit worse, like that separation is so huge. And whether that's, you know, hey, look, I'm going to I'm gonna take 10 shots on a goal in lacrosse a day. That's not even a lot of shots. Like, I'm going to go out there and shoot 10 in my front yard. Well, over the course of a year, that's 3,650 shots. And over the course of 10 years, that's 36,000 shots or whatever the, court, like, whatever the case is, whatever the math is. And it's like... You know, that's why those guys, like when Kobe Bryant talks about his, his routines, wake up at four, you get the two hours in, go to bed, you wake up at 10, you get the two hours in. And it's like, you know, that separation kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because it was just like small marginal gains year by year by year. And then it would just create an explosion. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy in the NBA that it's like, I think more so than any other sport is you don't become your best until like you're 28, 29, 30. It, yeah, know, yeah, it's it's funny cuz yeah. like you can you can take a little I I wouldn't say like a lot like a lot, but you can take a little step back athletically, but there's so much to know about the game. There's so many little like intricacies yeah. that that that's why I really love it is like, you know, I can go play against college kids right now. And I don't care if you're 6'10", like I'm getting shot off. And it's like, why am I getting a shot off? Well, I just know how to do this and you don't know how yeah. to defend it. And it's just right. a thing because I've studied it and I've, I've watched every YouTube video on how to score on bigger defenders. And I've, I've done the footwork to, to do all this stuff. And like, that's the thing about basketball I think is really cool. And that's why like a guy like LeBron's getting better and better every year statistically. It's like, this guy's 35. Like what is going on? Like, how how are you getting better? Yeah. So, yeah. If you could go back to, say, four, say 14, 15 years old, knowing that what you know now, what would you – what would – number one thing you tell yourself to do differently and number one thing you tell yourself to do the same? Um, to do the same is be open to, to helping people. Um, you know, I – I love taking phone calls from 20 year old kids who are managers of a basketball team and they're asking for advice and I love spitting the truth. Like I love being like, this is the reality. This is the industry we live in. Like, this is what we do. I'm going to be real. Like your LinkedIn message to me was a little dicey, but like, I want to help you. Like I want to, I want to help you. So when you reach out to that coach that ends up offering you a job, like, you know how to act in a professional method. You're not copying and pasting everything. You're not doing certain things. Like, I love that part of myself. So, like, I think just, you know, continuing to help people like that and help people grow and almost be a mentor. And then kind of the opposite. I wish I had a mentor at a younger age. I wish I had a um, – and I would say more of on a, like, a mindfulness – standpoint like I wish I almost had like a, a mental skills coach when I was like 16 and like taught me how to hone my own skills hone my own power my aggression like like I don't need to be out in the football field ripping off helmets like I was just a lunatic that I thought that I had to like mark my territory almost and it was like nobody's gonna mess with me and, and it's real like that's just what it was it was it was such a mentally weak thing to do but it was like at the time, it was like, I'm literally going to be the biggest badass on this field, and I don't care if people get hurt. And, like, that's obviously not the way to look at sports, and, like, that's not the point. But, like, that's what I was, and, like, that's not what I am now. So I wish I knew that at a younger age. When do you, when do you think that changed? Like, do you, do you – like, is there anything – like, once you kind of feel like you made that change, did it ever, like – did you ever get the urge to just snap on someone and you like anything you did to like control that or just be like, I know this is happening now, but when you did kind of overcome that stuff, anything that sticks out? Um, um, you know, you kind of just get an idea of 
of what matters. <laughs> um, like, like if you come up and you insult me, 18 year old Mitch is probably going to have some smart ass comment that's going to try to like, oh yeah, you think you're tough? Like that type of thing. When like, it shows more like, I, I would just be like, dude, you are such a low character person. Like, why are you like, you are a low life. Like, I'm not going to even like acknowledge you. Because like, if you're coming at me for whatever, like that's just, that's below me at this point. And I just, I don't know, like I've kind of, I've mellowed out a lot, but at the same time, like I have such a, a high confidence in like my core values and my core beliefs that like, I know that whatever X person says about, you know, my basketball skills, like that doesn't piss me off anymore. <laughs> and I don't know if there was an exact instance, but I think it's just, you know, the more and more reading and learning and TED Talks and this and that about how people deal with certain situations. And then you realize, like, you know, Mark Cuban's not getting flustered over a deal not going through. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. You got, do you have any, do you have any favorite social media accounts or anything that you follow for, for that type of stuff? Um, you know, not necessarily. Like I said, I, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit and I follow a lot of different um, authors and I follow a lot of different people that, that do really special things. Um, but I think the biggest thing, especially somebody that's just trying to really, you know, learn new things and get perspective on certain things is, is TED Talks. And I think that that is like an absolute gold mine of knowledge like everybody can go on youtube and watch a nine minute ted talk that's a fact it's just are you like are you trying to actually better yourself or are you like are you too busy you're gonna go watch you know some show like you can you can go watch two 10 minute ted talks and take something and take notes on your phone and an app and you do that every day for a month and then you're like, oh my God, I watched 60 videos and maybe one note from that entire month is something that changes your life. Got yeah. any, uh, any specific note or takeaway that you, off the top of your head that you've taken away from any TED Talks that sticks out? Oh, oh my God. I don't even know where this stuff is from anymore. I just, I've done it so many times. Um, you know, the, the big one is, you know, I don't know if it was a specific, you know, person or a specific talk, um, but like really, like, really like loving who you are. Like there's, there's some talks about like really like appreciating who you are as a person. And, you know, once you can do that, like it's so much easier to, to grow. And a lot of it, it's just like internal growth stuff. Like, you know, if you really love yourself and you really are, are content with, you know, what you're doing, who you are and like where you want to go, like everything else just seems to get easier. So kind of just like, it's hard to say like one specific note, but I know there's been multiple TED Talks that, that kind of rally around that. Um, I think that's gratitude. Really, yeah, just, yeah. Just gratitude. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely huge. I mean, I feel like a big thing is just letting things, just not getting in your own way and just like not forcing anything, just kind of letting things come and trying to just embrace them. Uh, we'll get last couple of questions here, a couple, a couple quick hitters. Uh, this, one, this one's going a little long right now. It's, you know, it's going by fast. Uh, favorite, favorite purchase under $100 that brings you the most joy? favorite purchase under a hundred dollars oh man uh it's got to be like an activity it's got to be going to do something um uh, oh man that's so tough I, i'd probably have it'd have to be like some type of like festival or some type of like concert ticket something yeah. that i can be with people and you know, so, so yeah, it's supposed to be at Dave Matthews tonight, front front yeah. general admission pit in New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. like there's nothing like those those things. Like it's I, I'm not a very materialistic person. I actually like sell everything I own. So like, uh, I don't really know. I don't. Yeah, I get. 
Um, I mean, like the idea there. Uh, anything you're open, openly experimenting with or want to try in the future? Um, I'm actually in the process of, you know, trying to consolidate some thoughts into writing a book. Um, that's something I'm really open to. I have, uh, you know, the, the groundwork kind of laid out and it's more about, you know, again, kind of to go back to what we were talking about before. I, you know, if you take notes one day or take one note every day for three months, you get 90 notes and, you know, kind of just dump that into a Excel doc or something like that. And then, you know, after a certain point, I'm going to consolidate that and see if I can turn it into uh, a book. What, uh, what type of book are we looking at? Like just uh, like a lot of stuff you've been talking about mindfulness culture, culture. Yep. And I think, my, I think mindfulness is a huge part of culture and being able, kind of like you said, like, you know, I was a lunatic and then if you, I might be a lunatic in a different way now, but it's definitely not about being like angry and rip, ripping people's helmets off. Like, like I have a different perspective on things. And I think that's a huge part of building a good culture is, you know, having gratitude, you know, all these, all these different things. So I like it. Um, I guess we'll, we'll close it up. Con unless Connor, you got any other questions on your end? No, this was awesome. I think, uh, I'm excited to hear this last one. All right. So, so la last question, if you could put something on a billboard for billions of people to see every single day, what would you put on that billboard? Wow. Um, I think it would, honestly, I think it would just be like, it would just say smile. Smile? Yeah. I know that's kind of corny, but like, I think like, I don't know, seeing that, just driving by and seeing a billboard that just says smile, like just puts you in a good mood. Like just, I don't know, yeah. simple, just. Smile. Smiles are tight. What was, what was your answer? Mine? Maybe I, haven't, um, I, haven't had, I haven't had an answer. I haven't had to. What are your answers? Let's, let's flip this around. What's your guys' answers? Oh, uh, you know, we've heard so many different ones that it's like. What are some of the other ones you've heard? I like the one that I liked. The one that I liked the other day was with Shannon Breezy, the guy who we interviewed the other day about. He's like a footwork and like has his own gym, but he's kind of like kind of hustled as like a, as like a trainer and stuff, like took some leaps, had to, you know, take some pay cuts. But he basically said, go get your dreams as opposed to like follow your dreams or chase your dreams. Cause his idea was basically, you know, if you're just chasing your dreams, you're never really going to catch them. So his kind of spin on that would go get your dreams and just obviously make it happen. Just have actionable things. And as opposed to just chase your dreams, that's been the one that's kind of stuck out to me so far. Um, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would solidify that as my answer, but off the top of my head, that's the one that's kind of resonated, resonated I, with me the most. I feel you though. I think it's about just like, it's gotta be something positive toward, toward people. Like it's gotta be like yeah. a, a positive thing. And like what, what can be more like transferable to anybody in the whole world than something to say, just like smile or just like laugh or something like that. It's just so, yeah. so yeah. simple and like profound. I agree. So uh, one I always think about I think it's just like this one's resonated with me since kindergarten. It was like just treat others how you would want to be treated. Yeah. And I think that just resonates with me a ton. The goal yeah. how I treat other people is like sometimes, you know, people like might question how I if I press the issue on things, but like that's how I would want to be treated. So mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing I try to follow. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. I think uh that might wrap it up for for this one for part one part one at least part, part one is an hour and a half long so <laughs> that's a good hour and a half i already lost my voice so that's good yeah lost the train of thought one time yeah only once though one blackout <laughs> one, one blackout that's from the helmet coming off too many times yeah <laughs> that's from the one time someone got me back and tried to rip my helmet off i, yeah. I lost <laughs> oh, man, this is awesome Mitch it was great hearing from you and uh, I appreciate it, honestly yeah. uh, very thoughtful stuff so uh, it was great to hear yeah, appreciate that. yeah. I'm, I'm excited to... hoping, 
like I said, we're, we're hoping to get into basketball eventually. And, you know, like, like I've told you before, you're our, you're our number one guy to, to hit up when we get into that right. realm for sure. Yeah, and, you know, I think you guys have such a, a cool, you know, you're really trying to, like, change it. Like, there's all these things, like, whatever, coach me or coach up or whatever they're called. But, like, you know, focus on your one thing right now. Like, I remember when you were asking me about names, like, months and months ago. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God, like, no. <laughs> like, like some of like the names and I was like, wow. Like, and then all of a sudden, like I saw like train my game. I was like, that's so cool. Like, that's awesome. It's just a cone. Like that's so like, that's so dope. And it could like, it could work. Like it's something that like actually like means something. It was yeah. it, well, just to like, see how far you guys have gone. Like even in six months or a year or whatever, when we first started talking. Yeah, definitely. have had some, like I said, we had some pivots from being like, all right, we're going to raise $300,000 from the yeah. athletes. And like when we first talked to you, um, then just like to the name and stuff. And like I said, I mean, we obviously like with train my game, the idea is just to keep it kind of universal where it's not just yeah. specific to lacrosse, the cone, not just specific to lacrosse. Yeah. And that's the whole thing with like the podcast. It's like, obviously we want to prove out the idea with lacrosse, but I think there's a ton of parallels in, in all sports really. And mm -hmm. I mean, just getting, getting you on here, opening up the conversation with some other sports, getting some just general trainers in there. Just, I feel like there's just tons of parallels and, you know, hopefully as we get into other sports, we can, you know, do more of doing more specific stuff in other sports. But, but for now, I mean, this is, this has been great. And I mean, we're going to keep going and see what happens. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Root for you guys. All right, Mitch. All right. Thanks again. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll keep in touch, and uh, we'll probably we're trying to get into like releasing podcasts like Monday Fridays. So this will probably be a couple weeks, probably maybe like three weeks out when we put it up. But but we'll yeah. uh, we'll keep you in the loop with everything. And like I said, best of luck, and I hope to I'll be I'll be, I'll be following you on LinkedIn and everything, and stay in touch. For sure. And if Con ever walk in or anything, just get it from Sam and. I mean, I'm down for down for whatever. Awesome. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Thanks again. Yeah, we'll catch you later. All right. Catch you yeah. later.